Aloha and good afternoon. My name is Jürgen Steinmetz, joining you from the Breaking News Show and Itobo News in Honolulu, Hawaii. With me is Dr. Peter Charlo. He's joining us from College Station in Texas. As you can see, it's a nice, uh, fairly sunny day here in Honolulu. I'm outside, actually, at the Ala Moana Shopping Center in Honolulu, right in front of Nordstrom. And Peter, where are you and how's the weather where you are? Well, it's dark here because it's nighttime. Um, it's in College Station. We were supposed to have a very rainy, cold, miserable day, but it turned out to be a beautiful day. So a little bit of Hawaii came to Texas. And um, I'm here today. Tomorrow, I'll be traveling to uh, first Quito, Ecuador, and then on to a place called Manta, which is becoming very popular among Americans. And then finally to a place called Puerto Viejo which is a, um, one of the really pretty beach areas that's developing uh, across Ecuador. So um, Ecuador is trying to really work on developing its beach tourism. Uh, of course, the, the other side of that is the issue of security. They still have security issues in, in Ecuador. But if they're able to get control of those security issues, then they really will have some real competition for some of the other beach places around the world because they have wonderful sea life. And of course they have the Galapagos Islands, which are world famous and some really beautiful beaches, some really outstanding pristine beaches that have not been destroyed by over tourism. Now, wonderful. Well, I hope you have a safe trip. Yes. It's important. And if anyone knows about safety and security, it's you, yes. because you also wrote a book about it. It just came out. Tell us a little bit about your yes. book. This is my 10th book. And this is a book about the history of American and Mexican policing and how it interacts with the tourism industry. And what I really tried to do is look at uh, tourism in order to be successful has to have good policing. If you have insecurity, people just don't come. And I spend a lot of time talking about some of the riots that took place in the 2020s. And of course, there was the defund the police movement. And today we saw an issue of that in um, North Carolina, where one of the um, tourism communities in the western part of the state, which defunded its police, has had a sharp rise in crime. And that has caused a real drop in tourism. So there's a real interaction there. And uh, it's really important for the tourism industry to learn to cooperate with the police and vice versa. So what I do is I take people all the way back to uh, the pre-colonial times in the United States and talk about how um, there was unfortunately some really very negative beginnings to policing in the southern part of the United States. It dealt with um, looking to recover slaves, which obviously did not build great rapport with the Black community. And in the northern states, it was about really stopping strikes from taking place. And that also didn't create great rapport and a lot of corruption. And so that's, of course, the, ninth, the, the 17th, 18th, 19th century. Those are many hundreds of years ago. But police have to go beyond that and be able to really work with the entire tourism industry. On the other hand, I also look at the Mexican police. And we have really two issues there, internal problems within the Mexican police including uh, often lack of government support. But on the other hand, most people don't realize many of the resentments that take place go all the way back to the Monroe Doctrine. Now, in the United States, most people think of the Monroe Doctrine is really a good thing, keeping um, Europeans out of the Western Hemisphere, who in the Europeans were consistently in the 19th century trying to um, get involved in ways that they shouldn't be getting involved, especially, you know, France invaded Mexico in the 19th century and Napoleon III was defeated. We, from that, we have in the United States a holiday of Cinco de Mayo of May 5th, which is not a holiday, ironically, in Mexico, but it is a holiday in the United States. Where oh, wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> yes. So um, there's a famous statement when um, George Bush was having a fight with the president of Mexico, Vicente Fox, and he said, you will not be invited to our Cinco de Mayo of <clears throat> and uh, um, Fox, President Fox said, we don't, what is Cinco de Mayo? It's, is it the day before May 6th or the day after May 4th? Now, I've long thought we should really have the festival on May 4th because that's my birthday. 
and I, they should switch it to Quattro de Mayo. But so far, I haven't been able to convince anybody of that. Uh, but anyway, it's an American Mexican holiday. It's not a Mexican Mexican holiday. I had no idea. I thought it's everywhere in Mexico. It's no, no one in Mexico right. celebrates it. <laughs> in Mexico, <laughs> they celebrate Independence Day in September, but they don't celebrate Cinco de Mayo. It's only done in the United States, which is really based on the idea of having salsa, which in Spanish just means sauce, but in the United States it means a a a. a it's salsa picante. It means a, a a hot sauce, and with chips, which really people don't eat in Mexico either. These are Mexican American foods that we've implied the Mexicans have, but we don't. It's probably the same thing. We we probably have German American foods they don't have in Germany, or Irish American foods such as corned beef that do not exist in Ireland, um, or bagels that don't exist in Israel for most, of, uh, or imported from the United States. So or uh, Shamein, which is Chinese American food that doesn't exist in China. Um, yeah, and the, the local food is, is always as local as it gets where you are, but you can always integrate local food in ethnic food. Yes. And, uh, and make it local, you know, because we in, in the United States, we have so many communities with all uh, kinds of history and their own food requirements yes. and their own. It's, so my argument actually at the recent um, Hawaii tourism conferences when they're talking about supporting local food, my question is, what about me as a European who lived here for 35 years? Are you supporting my local food as well? Um, so I think when we talk about local food, we have to yes. see it in a different view. Sure, and just think about the fact that you have um, how many ethnic foods are really from someplace else? So people get to Israel and are shocked there that there are no bagels, because bagels are really from New York. People are shocked when they get to China and there's no chow mein because that's really invented in San Francisco. People are shocked when they get to Ireland and there's no corned beef and cabbage, which comes out of New York again. Um, the whole tacos thing is really, if from Mexico, is really not Mexican, it's American Mexican. So all of those are kind of interesting uh, combinations. And then sometimes they're re-imported back into the country we impose it on. So um, it's kind of interesting to see that. But um, anyway, I do go back to the, uh, all the way back to the uh, uh, Monroe Doctrine. Most Americans don't realize how many Latin Americans resented that document and, and saw it the other way around, not as a good thing, but as American interference. And that's created problems in policing all the way to the 20th century or 21st century. So this is a chance Peter, for both sides. Peter, how do you find the time to write this book. When do you write it? Because I mean, we talk constantly and you're right. always there and you're always available to do something and you're always busy. You have so many projects at the same time and you're yes. not 21 anymore either. So I don't no. understand how you find the time. <laughs> yeah, May 4th, I'll be 77. So uh, <laughs> definitely I'm not 21. That was a long time ago, <laughs> to say the least. But um, yeah, well, you know, I love what I do. And I think the real key to this is you stay young when you love what you do. You know, you're also not 21 and you also <laughs> love what you do. Um, really? I didn't know yes, that. <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, I love it uh, when I'm going to Mexico or I'm going to Ecuador or I'm going to Peru. The, you know, I, I especially love Latin American culture and it's kind of a shot in the arm. So. Of course, Latin America has its problems, as does the United States. I want to make that clear. You know, we, there's, as a matter of fact, no place in the world doesn't have problems. We uh, see that um, you have strikes in Europe all the time, though hopefully they made some sort of compromise in Germany and they won't have a strike. They every did, actually. This was the news from the weekend. After eight months, they finally signed an agreement. And this agreement is everyone who works in the public sector, and I think there are 1.6 million people in a public uh, a transportation sector and support, they're getting 3,000 euro and they're getting eventually it, uh, a 5% increase and more. So they really hit big and it's the largest increase in salary and contribution ever granted after World War II. So they have made a lot of projects. Uh, um, I think the strikes really helped uh, to get to this agreement. So let's hope this is the end of it. So yes, when you go that's the real through, Germany, through Germany or travel within Germany or out of Germany, 
you can actually be punctual again because Germans like to be on time. Yes. And this was really not a good uh, sign for yes. the image altogether. In those times, it was really a spectacular airline and took a real nosedive for a while. And hopefully it'll come back again to being good airlines. Of course, the big problem is that in six months, if they decide to go back on strike, are they going to take the money back? And we both <laughs> know the answer, and the answer is no. So um, hopefully these agreements function, but you never really know. But what we are seeing is some really strange things. For example, I've been reading reports about the, you know, the US and European sanctions on Russia seem to really have backfired. And that's kind of an interesting thing. Russian um, oligarchs are richer than ever. They've increased their wealth by billions of dollars. The Russian economy is booming. And um, what they've done is they're not selling energy to the West, but they're selling it to China, to India, to Iran, to many, you know, they've found other buyers. And so it's a real problem now because um, with the Pentagon leaks, we know that uh, Russia, Ukraine is doing much less well than we thought it was. Um, the Russian economy has not been hurt. And the Russian oligarchs, who we really went after, are richer than ever. And so the, so this is a real problem because the whole concept of the West to try to you know, uh, push Russia into a corner does not seem to have worked very well at all. So that's yeah. going to have a real impact on, on Europe and on the world. Yeah, and when it comes to the tourism industry, Russian inbound travel is still um, a big mark for many countries, especially in the Arab world. I can, I, I, yeah. uh, now one of my colleagues who is um, originally uh, from that region is uh, uh, meeting his parents in Dubai. Yeah. And, uh, and the tickets his parents paid to fly from Sochi, what is in yes. Southern Russia, to get to Dubai was almost $1,500. And it used to be like $150, $250 to visit these places. So uh, the tourism industry is making money on the situation that uh, there is a high demand um, on trips outside Russia, but people are paying the price and the flights yeah. are full. So the real question is, if the sanctions had worked so well, how could they afford to pay these prices? And if they can afford to pay the prices, then we know the sanctions are not working like we thought they were. Yes, absolutely. And uh, it's it's uh, there's always a second part to a story. And um, I know the sanctions probably work in a lot of fields. Russia is isolated, what I think is good under the circumstances. But yes. did the sanctions really work for Putin? It's, we're not really against the Russian population. No, of course you know, not. we're against uh, we're, we're against the leader in right. this country, and uh, as you rightfully say, the people who had the money even have more money now, and that doesn't yeah. sound the, very because good. Because Putin by himself is nothing. It's Putin is um, backed by oligarchs, and that was one of the reasons we went after these oligarchs. And if they have more money now than ever before, then you know what? They're going to they're going to be very happy with Putin. They're not going to have a coup d'etat is going to be very much on the other way around. They're going to support him because he's increased their wealth, ironically. Yeah, and it's, it's definitely a thing. Well, we got your book covered. And if you yes. wanted to get Peter's book, I would really recommend investing in it. We actually, you see a link in almost every article on e News. And uh, we have your book included. So you click Thank on you. it. And right. it goes to Amazon, so Peter can sell his books. You know, he doesn't get paid for what he's doing. No, I don't. So come on, help him, help him with the book, please. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I, it's a really good book for anyone who's interested in law enforcement, policing, and while it emphasizes the United States in Mexico, it really touches upon all of Latin America and all of the United States. It shows the good parts of American and Mexican policing, and it shows areas that we are challenged and we need to improve upon. And it's written from the perspective also of tourism and tourism to survive needs to have a safe and secure environment. If not, the whole industry eventually has some real problems. So I really wanna thank you um, for uh, pushing the book. I, I appreciate that. And- uh, Yeah, no, no, not only that, Peter, if you actually click on this link, 
And if you don't find it, you can just simply go to eturbonnews.com slash shop. And uh, you find also a link to this book. And uh, you will also find, I don't know how many books you wrote. You said 10 or 11. Yeah, I think it's all on the same, it's all on the same page. So you yeah. can get some of the books I think that this Peter is my, wrote before. My, my 10th book. And the next book I'm going to write with a friend of ours from Jamaica. And it's going to be uh, about um, the whole issue of, unfortunately, human trafficking and how that interacts with tourism. Because that's, uh, that's a problem that exists in the United Absolutely. States, in Latin America, in Europe, in it's Asia. Everywhere. 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 And everywhere. So this human really... trafficking is, is a spell. And you know, I served on the United Nations World Tourism Organization task force against human trafficking of children for more than 10 years. Yes. And unfortunately, under the current uh, leadership since 2000 and uh, what was it, 18, when uh, Mr. Zurab took over, this task force was eliminated. But it, it's still, it's a very important issue um, and it, oh. people should be aware of it. And yes. uh, it's everywhere in the world. And uh, there are some countries that really did a good job, like Brazil was one of them. In Brazil, you have a special phone number. And, and when you go to an airport or arrive at an airport, you see this number. Um, I think it was 115, like similar to 112, what's the emergency number. Yeah. So people can remember to report suspicious activities. There are big that's a signs good thing. Yes. when you come into Costa Rica, pointing out that if you deal with any form of sexual inappropriateness, we'll call it that way, with children, or trafficking in while on Costa Rican territory, you will be spending getting free hotel space, meaning you're going to jail. Um, so and hopefully for a long time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a, it's, it is, you could say it's a hotel, but it's not the type of hotel you want to go to. No, absolutely. And there's a lot of things coming up. Uh, I wanted to mention this. There's IMEX and um, Etobo News and also the World Tourism Network is uh, participating in IMEX Frankfurt. IMEX is the largest and probably now most known meeting and incentive trade show every year. There are two of them, one in Frankfurt, one in Las Vegas, and we're both. So whoever, uh, if you are in Europe or if you're attending, just stop by our stand. We would love to see you. And that's going to happen, I believe, from the 21st to the, or 22nd to the 25th of May. And after this, um, I'll be traveling to Kathmandu and I'm really looking forward to this in Nepal. And um, I'll be speaking actually, and we're partnering with the Himalayan um, Adventure Tourism uh, Conference and World Tourism Network is going to be a major partner in this event. So I'm looking forward to traveling to Nepal. Um, it's a really exciting country. So even if you're not into mountain climbing, there's a lot of other things to do just yes. enjoy the scenery alone and the culture. And um, it's an amazing place to travel to. So if yes. you do want to go there, just go to WTN.travel, click on upcoming events, and you can sign up and um, let, let's have a coffee or something together when you get yes. to Nepal. And, and one of these days, I hope to be able to get to Nepal. So uh, I don't know if I can climb at my age, uh, uh, Mount Everest anymore. But I'm sure I could get to see some beautiful mountains. And I understand wonderful wildlife also. Absolutely. And yeah, no, uh, we, I'm not going to be the climber either. So you're not going to see me on top of Mount Everest. It wouldn't be a long, <laughs> healthy yeah. trip for me. But it's still, it's, yeah, it's an amazing scenery. Uh, beautiful people and the food is outstanding. So really, it's, um, it's a little bit different from Indian food. It's more spicy. Uh, but delicious. So uh, um, just join me. You have a wonderful time. Doing. Right. And meanwhile, I'll be working on hopefully starting of a new tourism security conference in Peru. I'll be um, next month in Mexico and uh, at what, what they call the Pueblos Magicos or the magical towns. And if you've never been to those, the interior of Mexico, these are really wonderful places to visit. And there's unique culture. And for those of you who are listening who are American, what I love about Mexico is it's so close and yet it's so foreign. So you don't have to travel across the ocean one or two hours on, on, or less by airplane, or you could even drive it. And wow, you're in a completely different world. So um, it, that really is special for Americans because 
you, you feel like you've stepped back in time and gone to a completely different continent and it's just across the border. Absolutely. Well, Peter, I hope you have a safe trip. Thank you. And I uh, hope uh, maybe we speak when you're in Ecuador. Yes, that'd and, be great. Uh, for every, and for everyone else, if you miss the first part of this, um, most likely we'll repeat it. We're going to repeat it um, all day on and off, but you can always go back and go to um, to breakingnewsshow.com and see all our shows, breakingnewsshow.com. And thank you again, and aloha from Hawaii, and good Take day care. to you, Peter, and everyone else. Looks like you got some rain clouds coming in, so stay dry. Thank you, Peter. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye-bye.